Thank you, Alice. Please do keep your Bibles open at that passage, Genesis 6 and 7. And there's an outline of where we're heading on the reverse of the notice sheet you were given. Our question for today is, how will the world end? It seems there are a number of options on the table. Planet Earth could be hit by an asteroid from outer space. Uh, The sun, it seems, will also run out of gas eventually. We hope that's a long way off. But could the effects of climate change maybe speed that up and prove catastrophic a little sooner? What if the world's nuclear arsenal was unleashed? Movies like Armageddon, Deep Impact, 28 Days Later, 2012, each give us their vision, their portrayal of the end of the world as we know it. And those movies made money at the box office, in part, no doubt, because people are worried what's in store for our planet. So much so, it seems. Did you know the US space agency, NASA, has a page on its website reassuring us it's okay, the world won't end, at least not in 2012. What a relief. Well, last week, here at the four o'clock, we were thinking about what we wanted to be when we grow up. Well, this week, we're going to think a little bit bigger picture. What does the future hold on a larger scale? What's going to happen to planet Earth? Now, with all these theories around, where should we look for answers? Can we know what's in store? And we might not think to look in the book of Genesis. After all, everyone knows, don't they, that's about beginnings, which it is. But Genesis is also about the end of the world. Now, this is quite a clever idea, but I can't actually claim it for myself. This is what Jesus said. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus is speaking about himself. He's the Son of Man, God's great King, as spoken about in the Old Testament. And Jesus said he will return as the Son of Man to wind up history as we know it. We want to know what it will be like. Well, Jesus says it will be as what's happened before in Noah's day. So if today we want to know what will happen at the end of the world, we're going to follow Jesus' direction and turn to Genesis to find out. Our passage this afternoon gives us two headlines for the future. The first, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Our account begins with a reminder of what God sees on the earth in chapter 6 and verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. It's a sad sight. We saw last week God was sorry that he'd made man. It grieved him to the heart. He can't allow it to go on. So what next? Judgment? Well, not quite. First, the warning is sounded. And we see that warning sounded in verse 13. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Somber words for Noah to hear. God is going to destroy the earth. But Noah hears it in advance, beforehand. Noah's told what is yet to come. So what does God think of our world today? Well, the same as he did then, because the world hasn't changed. What's God going to do about it? The same as he's going to do then. He's going to judge it. And how do we know that? Because we've been warned. We've heard from Jesus himself. Like Noah, we've been let in on God's plans. If you remember the film 2012, which actually came out two or three years ago, it was all about cataclysmic events on the earth, and the big strapline in all the uh, publicity was, we were warned. Well, the same is true for Jesus' return. So many people think Christianity, well, that's just a lifestyle choice. I might add a spiritual dimension to my life. No, Christianity, if you like, is a warning for all who live on earth today. Watson Helen's here for? 
plonked in the middle of London, well, we're to sound the warning bell. We've got the week of talks. We could call it the week of warnings. A whole week where we're going to warn the world what is coming. I trust David Cook will warn that, sound that warning very clearly. And we need to pray and work hard, get people here to hear it before it's too late. So, as in Noah's day, today every individual has turned his or her back on God. The world's corrupt, but Jesus is going to return in glory to sort it out. The sort it out doesn't quite convey what's going to happen. What will it be like at the end of the world? Well, let's look again to Genesis, where we see devastating destruction. There will be devastating destruction. So the warning's been given, and now look across to chapter 7 and verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. So it started to rain. It's been a rainy week in London, but not like this. Here it rains, and it rains, and it rains. Forty days and nights. And the result? Look down to verse 20 of chapter 7. The waters prevailed <coughs> excuse me, above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Make no mistake, water is deadly. I had a friend at university doing the same subject as me. One summer he went off to Malaysia, white water rafting, fell in the current, his body was later discovered downstream. A uh, hundred years since the Titanic, we've seen, haven't we, on TV, these films and programs trying to show the panic as the deluge rises and the ship goes down. Who can forget the pictures of the 2004 Asian tsunami and more recently in Japan? A wall of water taking away, drowning everything in its path. This is devastating destruction. And so it was in Noah's day. We forget this, don't we, with a nice children's story version. My house is full of them. Colourful arcs, happy, smiling animals on the deck, enjoying a pleasant day trip. It's ridiculous. That's the sanitised version. Let's not be lulled into a false sense of security. The flood brings carnage. Life on earth is brought to an end. Verse 22. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. I'm not sure if decreation is a proper word. It's not in my dictionary. I checked and Microsoft Word had lots of red wavy lines on the screen. But it conveys what is happening as we read this uh, Genesis account. God is doing away with what he's created. Do you remember we saw back in Genesis 1, the waters above were separated from the waters below. And then each was in its life-giving place. But now with a flood, the waters are merging again. And the created order is unraveled. The Lord gave the breath of life. Now he takes it away. So what is the future of our world? Listen now to the words of Jesus' disciple, Peter, from his second letter. He looked back to the flood and says this. The earth that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. So when Jesus returns, it is going to be devastating. It simply will be the end of the world as we know it, with destruction everywhere. Just like in Noah's day. And this devastating decreation came just as God had said. Uh, look back to chapter 6, verse 17, where God said to Noah, for behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. 
everything that is on the earth shall die. So as we've just seen, why did every living creature die? Because God had said so. He gave the warning and it happened. Uh, chapter 7, verse 4, God says, In seven days I will rain, send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And then across to verse 23, He, that is God, blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animal and creeping things and birds of the heavens. Do you see, the writer uses exactly the same word to make sure we don't miss it. Every living thing was blotted out. As always, if God has said it, he'll do it. And here again is that pattern beginning in Genesis that follows right through the Bible. Countless examples of what God says he does. God's word is something that we can and must stake our life on. Because if we don't, we'll end up losing that life. So here we are in a world, aren't we, full of confusion. No one really knows where we're going. Well, we do. We are in the know. We know what's going to happen. We know judgment is coming. We know what it's going to be like. It's going to be devastating. But the fact that we know this is, isn't it, God's kindness warning us ahead of time. And we can be sure it will happen not only does God say it, but he's shown us in the past what it will be like. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. So the only ones on that day who are going to be surprised are the ones who haven't been paying attention to what God is saying now. Now I'm aware that what we've heard so far is fairly familiar stuff if we've been a Christian for any length of time. The challenge to us is to keep on believing it, and maybe more than that, given its importance, to keep it at the top of the agenda. Maybe that gets harder the more we go on as a Christian. Because the more we go on, well, the more we heard it. And we heard it a long time ago. We believed it, sure. But after years of following Jesus, well, the end hasn't come. So we begin to presume, don't we? We would never articulate it, but we begin to think, well, nothing's going to happen, at least not in my lifetime. I wonder if Noah felt the same. No doubt not at first, when God warned him, he'd have set to work on the ark with vigour and enthusiasm. But uh, this would have taken him days and months and years. We can imagine him, can't we, lying awake in bed at night, asking himself, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why am I living this way? As he carried on with this ridiculous boat building project, all around him life went on as normal, you see. Jesus tells us people are eating and drinking, marrying, being given in marriage, just as they are today. So easy for us, isn't it, to get caught up with life's activities. Hard to keep Jesus' warning at the forefront of our minds. Because if we do, of course, others will scoff. And who wants to look silly? But more than that, maybe as we see that life going on around us, we think, well, I want to join in. Maybe I could begin to think more, well, why can't I have the kind of money that means I can wine and dine, eat and drink, as I would like to? Even if it means work leaves little time for serving fellow Christians. Maybe now we long to be married we have done for years. And now we'll even risk our Christian commitment to find that spouse. Well, the warning is as true for us today as it was the first time we heard it. That might be years or decades ago, but what's changed? God has no habit of going back on what he's said. Any delay is only because wonderfully he is patient. But let's never make that mistake of mistaking patience for impotence. The devastating end of the world will come, just as God has said. Well, what we've heard so far, of course, leaves a rather pressing issue that we've yet to address. 
Judgment is coming. As God has said, it's going to be devastating. Well, how should we respond? Despair? Panic? Well, no, because at the end of the world, not all will be destroyed. We look back to Genesis and it shows us the Lord God provides a rescue. The Lord God provides a rescue. So there's a flood, we've seen devastating decreation and water everywhere. But you'll have noticed when I read verse 23 earlier, I left out the last line. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. So Noah and his family, safe and dry. And the question must be, well, how come? Well, God not only warned Noah and told him what was going to happen, we also see that he gave Noah precise instructions. So let's look back again to the beginning of the account and verse 14. God says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Now God here could simply have said to Noah, build a boat. It would have been a lot quicker. But to notice the key phrase at the beginning of verse 15, where he says to Noah, this is how you are to make it. That sounds a little like the instructions my wife gives me on how to use the washing machine. This is how to do it. Maybe poor Noah didn't know the first thing about shipbuilding. But that's not the point here. What matters is Noah needed to listen to exactly what God had said. Because God knew what was required. And Noah should do that. If only I think we could have seen the look on Noah's face as he was given these instructions. Even the most fiendish piece of Ikea flat pack furniture has nothing on this. Now, 300 cubits is the length of one and a half football pitches. Can you imagine being given instructions to you and your family to build a boat that big? It's going to take years. Imagine the amount of planks of go forward he's going to have to source. Imagine what must be the size of his back garden for this DIY project. The Noah family are going to keep going and going at this. Who knows what Noah thought he was going to use his DIY tools for. Maybe he wanted a bigger bungalow or a convertible to build for the driveway. But no, a house and a car isn't what was needed. God said, these are instructions, do this. Then Noah will be safe. And again, as we read on in the Bible, this isn't the only occasion that we get detailed instructions Think of the measurements for the tabernacle in Exodus, into Leviticus, the requirements of the sacrificial system. God always knows exactly what is needed. He shares it with us, and his people are to follow to the letter. So today, we've heard, we've been warned, the end of the world is coming. So how should we respond? What should we do? What do we need? And Genesis is showing us we can't decide for ourselves. We need to listen to God to find out. Which is exactly, of course, what lots of people don't do. Many people are aware of judgment to come, that Mount express it like that, but they think there may well be a final reckoning with some kind of God. So what do they do? Well, some of them think, oh, I know, I'll put in an appearance at church now and again. They might start thinking I should give a little bit more to charity. Become more tolerant of others, of those around me. Sort out my life a little bit. People really do those kind of things because they've worked out. They think, well, if I do that, I'll be all right. But of course, such efforts are about as useful as Noah building that bungalow. Point is, we respond to God's warning on his terms, not on ours. And the wonderful news is that God, when he gives the warning, keeps speaking and tells us there is a place of safety. The whole Bible directs our attention to its location. God tells us where to find the rescue, although it might seem to be the most unlikely place. Not for us an ark, but a cross. Now those investigating Christianity say they come on a CE course. They often say, as you go around the group asking, why are you here? They say, well, I'm looking for something. But as over the weeks they are directed to the cross, well, 
That's not quite what they're looking for. It's so unimpressive. It's not what they had in mind. That's not what they were thinking of adding to their life. Who knows, maybe Noah thought that when God said, build an ark. But God was right. God knows what he's doing. Like Noah, we must list the precise instructions which take us to the cross. That is where rescue is to be found. And when God does provide that rescue, it is salvation through judgment. Salvation through judgment. Again, notice how God did this rescue. So he tells us he's going to send water on all the earth and cover it. Well, what to do with Noah, who we know has found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Maybe um, God could give him a space rocket and send him out of the world for a little bit while the rains fell. No. Maybe God could um, maybe spare that little bit of the world, Noah and his back garden, so that he and the family could stay dry. No. No, the water was going to cover all the earth. Noah would still be on the earth as the rain fell and the water levels rose. So if you like, Noah is going to face this storm, but he'd be in the ark. And notice again what God said about the ark back in verse 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. That was vital. A leaky boat is no use at the best of times. But with this flood coming, the ark had to be absolutely watertight. Noah, cover it with pitch inside and out. And then he would be safe. If like Noah would be provided with a cover, the rain would fall, but it wouldn't touch him, his family, or the animals inside. So Noah wasn't so much taken away from God's judgment as saved through it. And the same will be true when this world comes to an end. God is angry with this world, with each person, with each of us, for the way we've treated him and one another. He cannot simply say to some, forget it, I won't judge, he has to. So what we need is somehow to be saved, but through that judgment. The judgment I deserve must fall, but somehow I need to be safe. And of course, that can only happen at one place. There's a reason why the whole of the Bible points us to the cross of Jesus. There is refuge, but only there. God's judgment there falls, but on Jesus. Like that ark, for us, the cross is a place of safety and security. As the old hymn puts it, a shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. So let me ask us, are we tempted to move on from being a Christian? Do we think, maybe I'll be better off elsewhere, the grass is greener on the other side? The question this passage asks of us is, where will you be when God's judgment falls? Are you thinking of going to another religion? Or no religion? Again, if you do, how will you fare on that day? My hunch is those aren't particular dangers for us, but maybe another kind of Christianity. Maybe one that's a little bit easier, not so demanding. A Christianity that doesn't make so much of the cross. Do you really want to move away? Because sticking close to Jesus and his death is, was the only the very best place to be. We know what the future holds. And if we're there, we can look forward with confidence. We have found certain shelter from God's judgment. We see life beyond, and there we'll find a new world. So we've seen Noah was saved from this earth full of corruption, rescued from God's judgment, which blotted out every other evil thing question is, what was he saved for? Where is it all heading? What lies beyond? Well, remember when we left it, Noah was left in this box, bobbing about on the top of the water. But then we get what is a turning point in this passage at the beginning of verse 8. But God remembered Noah. 
Now, remember there, of course, does not mean that uh, poor Noah had slipped God's mind for a bit, and uh, thankfully something's jogged God's memory. No, rather, God remembering is the way the Bible describes that God does not abandon his people who he's committed himself to. Even in the midst of his judgment, Noah and his family are safe, and God will protect them, never let them go. And then look what God provides for them. Listen to what happens. Chapter 8, verse 1, and the end of that verse. God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. Uh, The word here for wind is the same for spirit. There's a spirit over the earth. Into verse 2, the waters recede. They separate from one another. On in verse, chapter 8, verse 11, the waters, the dry ground then appears from the waters. Uh, down in verse 17, we discover why Noah had to go to the effort of all those animals in the ark with him. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. I hope all this is ringing bells for us, because of course what's happening here, the order and the events are reminding us of the original creation account back in Genesis 1. So here before us, this side of the flood, a new creation emerges. So if God's judgment is decreation, here's the recreation. The other side of devastating destruction lies new creation. And it's the same for us as it was in Noah's day. When this world, as we know it, comes to an end, as God has promised, there won't be nothingness but a new world. And it'll be a wonderful world, better than our wildest dreams, because there won't be any of the corruption or the violence or any of those other things that spoil life now. We'll be with God in this world as he intended it to be. So our question, what lies in store for the future of our planet? We know, because we've been told, and we've been seeing something similar before in Noah's day. God will act in judgment, leading to a new world. We've been warned, we're to listen to it, and get to that place, and stay there, where salvation of that judgment is to be found. Take refuge at the cross of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray as we close. Our Father, it's sobering to hear again of what this world deserves and where it is heading. But we thank you for this warning given to us ahead of time. We praise you for providing a safe refuge for us at the cross of your Son. Please would we remain there all our days. Help us to warn and plead others to do the same as we await with confidence that new creation. For Jesus' sake. Amen.